Hey guys, it is now, let's see, what, what day is it right now? It's Monday, November 13th. Um, so I'll talk about books another day, but I just really wanted to show you what I've been drawing. I wanted to take you through a little tour of my sketchbook. So I've been listening, this is what I've been working on. I've been drawing Itzy's Yeji, who is just really stunning. I love this picture of her. It, Itzy always has this attitudinous stance. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not focusing too much on the face right now. I'm not super good at faces. I need to work on them. But right now I'm really working on anatomy and like, uh, body structure and proportions. So, um, so I've been working on, this is a male from the back. So now I'm doing, um, let's see, what's his name? It's, uh, Changbin from Stray Kids. Let me show you the picture that I'm working off of. There we go. <laughs> no, not Chingmin. I'm sorry. It's a uh, Bangchan from Stray Kids. So that's what I was drawing last night. So, and I was working on the female figure, and that's why I was doing Yeji as an example of that. And then I worked on the male figure from the front as well, and I drew a little sketch of Jungo of 80s. My old bias. <laughs> Um, so I'm just doing really simple ones and just trying to get the body proportions right. And Ezekiel, um, chapter 1, verses, verse 28 has been my memory verse lately. I've been going through Ezekiel and I've been doing so well on Ezekiel, like, and praying and stuff. I've just been doing just pages and pages of time with God lately and it's been amazing. So I asked for a new journal for Christmas. Um, cause I have plenty of room still in this one, but I just want to be prepared. So I got a, I asked for a gigantic journal for Christmas. But anyway, here's the, as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. And then the rest of it that I'm memorizing right now is, um, as the appearance of the rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So the appearance, um, so let's see, sorry. So was the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Good morning vlog. There's some deer this morning. I had to show you. Kevin and I are watching Twister. Give me, give me that, give me hit it bang, run it, run it back, and I'm a that away, never better play, it's a bang.
a bunch of mushrooms sprouted up in our backyard overnight because it's been raining. They're so cute. Hello there guys, it is Sunday, November 19th. It's 2.13 in the afternoon and it's been a great week over here. So I thought I'd just tell you how I've been doing with my reading. I haven't finished, I don't think anything, but I made progress on quite a lot of things. So next week, that should hopefully mean I finish quite a lot of things. We'll see. So um, yeah, let's just get started. So first I'll talk about All Quiet on the Western Front, which I am reading for World War November. And I've been meaning to read this for so long. So I'm really grateful to Tristan and the rest of the co-hosts um, for doing World War November with me because, uh, and, and again, it was Tristan's idea. So I'm just glad to be along for the ride. And um, this book has been, wow, so powerful. The descriptions of the things that happen in it are so terrible. It just... It makes you realize how not surprising it is that veterans come home with a lot of problems that they have to now deal with for the rest of their lives because of the stuff that they've seen. Like, it's pretty terrifying, the stuff that is described in this book. I won't describe any of that, um, but it's also very poetic, I think is how uh, Chelsea described it on our reading screen. She said it's very poetic, and I agree it's extremely poetic the way it describes um the soldiers feelings uh Tristan mentioned they are they all feel very betrayed by their leaders so basically all quiet on the western front is from the german perspective and it's a youth perspective because it was the youth that went and fought this war you know everybody at home all their elders and um, everybody told them they need to go do this or we'll be ashamed of you. You need to go fight this war or we'll be ashamed of you, basically. And they trusted the people in power until they get to the front line and realize uh, just what they are being asked to do and forced to do. It's inhuman. It's terrible. War is. Um, yeah, I guess betrayal is really a good... Uh, descriptor for how the soldiers are feeling and um there's one s section in here where one of the soldiers who's like kind of more eloquent i would say than the rest not that anybody isn't is particularly not eloquent but um he's one who is kind of a leader among the group he's able to always find food for the group um when nobody else can find food um the soldiers were eating better than the people back at home in germany but they weren't <laughs> getting enough all the time and so this soldier i think his name is cats um i'm having trouble keeping track of who all the characters are i think because they're known by their last names like exclusively and so it's harder to keep track of them because it's just a bunch of last names but this one is pretty memorable um so and there's a scene where he brings a bag of horse flesh and like a handful of fat and just starts making a fire and and making food for everybody and they're just like where did you find this food <laughs> and that's that's and, and a a loaf of bread that's still warm they're just like like you're just making a feast for us where did you find this stuff like normally they just don't have that kind of food so and it talks about them like trying to steal food and you know some of the hijinks that they do together and some of the bonding and then also some of some of the hazing and the terrible things that happen among the ranks it talks about how you give a man power he'll grab it and then he'll mistreat everybody under him in the army basically he's like uh the people in the army are not people who are trained in how to deal with power they're just like average everyday guys who suddenly find themselves with power over other men and often abuse it and so it describes kind of the kind of abuse that happens to them uh, from other higher up soldiers and the kinds of things that they actually see and face in the field and there's a whole list of the things that they try to train new arrivals in when they are sent to the front like how to how to decipher you know um what 
how to, to decipher like the certain sound that certain types of ballistics make when they are coming at you through the air and when to duck and, um, you know, how to pretend to be dead in the case of an invasion and just like so many different, um, it, it was just really like, wow, they, they had to make an art of death and survival and it just had to become instinct for them or they wouldn't survive. So, but there's this one great line where Katz, who's the really eloquent one who's able to find food all the time, he says that, Katz says, why don't we just throw the generals and politicians of all this, all these armies who want to fight? And anytime there's a declaration of war, it should be like a big fair. Everybody gets together, the common man just gets together and watches the generals duke it out, like man to man, like give them clubs and have them work it out so that the young men, like the 20 year olds aren't having to go and die and do all this. And I, I looked up in one case where our main character, he's in a, I'm trying to remember the exact terms, but he's in like a company, I think it was the term of men and only 38 of the company survive. And so I looked up how many are in a company and it was like, it was like 200 something. So I don't know about how all correct that is, but I did my best to do a little bit of research. And so, um, yeah, 38 out of over 200 was just crazy. So that's, that's the kind of numbers we're talking about. And they, they saw all of this happening to like their friends or to people who've just arrived at the front. So yeah, it's really intense. And, uh, I, I, I thought, oh, that's a good idea about making the generals fight. But there's so many quotes in here that we could talk about. Terror can be endured so long as a man simply ducks, but it kills if a man thinks about it. Terror kills if a man thinks about it. So basically, we can't really talk about what we're suffering here because or we can't really think about what we're suffering here or talk about it because that is how we will get killed if we start thinking about it. We just have to survive it. We just have to be like instinctual about it. So yeah, that's, it's really, it's really, uh, I'm glad that I'm reading it. I've been wanting to read it for forever. So I'm 72% through, so I should be finishing it very soon. So, and I watched The NeverEnding Story movie and I already brought it back to the library and it was so cute, guys. It was just as good as I remembered it as a kid. So I would highly recommend the movie if you've never seen it, um, especially if you have kids. But I still really enjoyed it as an adult and nostalgia might be talking somewhat, but maybe because it was like a major, <laughs> it was a Hollywood film. So it, it was put together pretty well compared to a lot of the things that I watched when I was younger. Um, a lot of things that I watched when I was younger did not hold up, but they were not all like Hollywood. A lot of them were like more independent type things. So yeah. Really love that. And we watched A Haunting in Venice as well this week with Kev's family. They came over and we watched it. I loved A Haunting in Venice. I thought it was great. Um, I love ghost stories though, so that's probably part of it. And I thought this was the best of the three Poirot films that have been with Kenneth Branagh. Um, Br Branagh? I just heard it. my mother-in-law pronounce it Branagh. And I was like, oh, is that how you say it? Branagh? Anyways. Um, yeah, I thought he did a fantastic job on Haunting in Venice and I enjoyed it so much. So, um, and as far as news podcasts, I asked for some liberal podcast recommendations in last week's update and y'all came through. So I've been listening to liberal podcasts and I've been really enjoying getting different perspectives. So, um, some of the ones that I really loved that I checked out were, um, Pod Save the World and Left, Right, and Center. And I just... I've been trying to remind myself that it's okay to not have the answers to everything um, because a lot of these problems are not simple. They're not, they're people who have PhDs in all of these issues that I am researching now and they don't know. They don't have exact answers. It's not like everybody, like there are certain facts that are accepted, but there's not many speculations or like solutions um, based on those facts that are widely accepted. Like, it's just hard to find those solutions. It's, it's not my job to find all the solutions, but I just wanted to be a little bit more informed about what's going on on a daily basis um, in America and in the world. So thank you so much for your recommendations. I, I've checked out, I believe, all of the recommendations that people sent me, and those were two of my favorites. So um, 
yeah what's next okay aquariums of pyongyang which i'm reading with uh joanna my bible study buddy so i am 63 percent through this and this is uh it it, in the introduction, it claims to be the first account out of North Korea, which is plausible because it was first published in 2000, which is really early. Um, a lot of the accounts that I have read of life in North Korea were published much later than that. Um, so this could this is like a classic of the North Korean defector uh, genre. A lot of people did not realize what was happening when this book came out they had no idea what was happening in north korea they did not know about the prison camps this one spends most of the book inside of a prison camp with the um, child who was sent there because of his grandfather even though his grandfather didn't do anything um his grandfather was caught up in a basically a political move like very stalinist tony recommended a movie that i've been watching um, about it's like a comedy about life in Stalinist Russia and I forgot to bring it back but I'll talk about it next week after I finish it um, and it this reminds me so much of Stalinist Russia like so his grandfather was punished just because there was like a widespread crackdown of people um, in his job or area of expertise and so this this grandson of his of the grandfather who was in trouble his whole family including this boy who was like 11 I think um were taken to a prison camp and they were like worked starved beaten abused people were murdered around him all the time they only survived because they started eating rats like it's crazy what he went through I think he's like 50 now so this happened this was quite a while ago that that was happening and I, but i'm sure not much has changed let's be honest not not much has changed in north korea it's probably just gotten worse so um 10 years in the north korean gulag is the subtitle and um so the person who experienced all this is kwan chul Huan and pierre rigolo i don't know how you say his name but he was the one who wrote this book for the west western consumption he was like we need to know what's happening we need to know about this in the west and he pierre understood the story through a translator so um it's really three minds on this story and i think it's really well put together and i'm learning so much so um what else did i write down here about it uh it gives a little bit of history in the introduction including like the korean war so if that's something you're not aware of this could be a good place to start because it gives you an introduction to that stuff and um it specifically calls north korea a stalinist regime um, which that's partly why i want to learn about communist leaders like mao and stalin and i think i i want to learn about them because there are so many different varieties and shades of communism and how it's been enacted in the world and i'm just like endlessly curious about that i don't know why there's something wrong with me but um regardless um what else since the 196 since 1960 it has provide it has it provide presided over an unprecedented economic boom north korea did um and then 30 years of oh no i'm sorry this is um south korea 30 years of unflagging effort has lifted south korea's economy from bangladeshi levels to parity with spain of course out of a whole book about north korea i pick out the quote about south korea to tell you guys about i'm obsessed with korea as a whole north and south um, but it's describing what seoul looks like and how quickly it has turned into it has turned itself into an industrial power and it's just wild because they they were a capitalist nation um and that's how they <laughs> pulled themselves out of this versus north korea which started off better um with a lot of support from the other communist nations they their their um their propaganda made everybody believe that north korea was doing a lot better but it was all lies as this guy's family found out they actually came from japan i believe his father was japanese yeah i think that's what it was um his his father was japanese and um his mother came from jeju island jeju do and that's in south korea and um 
they <laughs> the grandmother the matriarch of the family was a very strong communist and she really believed in the promise of the communist nation in North Korea specifically. There was quite a lot of propaganda being sent out at the time to all of the Koreans who were living in Japan. A lot of Koreans were brought to Japan as workers, basically. Like Japan forced a lot of Koreans to come over when they were in when Japan was an imperial power over Korea, it forced a lot of workers to come into Japan and work. And so some people were there for that reason. Other people were just, they just went there to work because they thought there would be better opportunities in Japan than there were in Korea. So that's, his family was in Japan and they were, they decided, um, the grandmother convinced everybody, the entire family to move to North Korea because they heard the propaganda and they believed it. And then when they got there, they realized how wrong they were very quickly. It did not take them long to realize how wrong they were. But regardless, the author talks about how he actually had a really happy childhood in Pyongyang. Um, they were relatively wealthy once the bureaucracy kind of figured out who they were and, you know, the kind of power they were bringing with them. They were a really powerful family. Um, they were treated really well until suddenly the grandfather was punished and the whole family just they had to be punished apparently and sent to this so it was it's quite interesting because he has a real nostalgia for Pyongyang he really enjoyed his childhood there he had a great childhood um even though his family was suffering the older members turned to like alcoholism and stuff like that because they they knew what was happening and they knew they had made a grave mistake in moving from Japan to North Korea but the child the children they were they were having fun and the aquariums of Pyongyang refers to the boy childs, um, the, the grandson that we're following, his uh, aquariums, everybody had a, aquariums apparently at the time. And so he really prized his fish and he always got the most expensive ones and he would go to the fish store every day to p see what else is new, what can he stick in his fish tank and impress all his friends with them. And um, yeah, so following the story of those fish is why it's called the aquariums of Pyongyang some degree so yeah um and he talked about how he actually as a child did not believe that kim jong-un um, or kim jong-il the leaders of north korea <laughs> that they urinated or defecated because they were like gods to him he was like gods don't do that <laughs> like he talks about like the extreme complete indoctrination that he experienced so yeah and yeah I, I just, I know that some people claim that North Korean defector memoirs are exaggerated and there has been times where they lied and we found out about it, but I just think it's really important to read these stories anyways because there's some things that cannot be denied. And I think the more the West knows about these things, the more we can do to put pressure on North Korea and China to stop these abuses, these human rights abuses from happening. I'm going to be researching how to... Um, like maybe write letters to my Congress people about it and I'll, I'll keep, I'll start looking into it as far as what can be done and what, what we can write specifically to them to make a difference because I think if enough people are writing to them regularly and making an issue out of it. Recently, um, there was a congressman interview that said if they got like 250 letters on a topic, that would make them think, oh, this is a concern of the American people. 250 letters. That's not that many. So yeah, if we can like mobilize and, and write to them about this issue, it might become an issue that becomes part of our political discourse. Because right now, nobody talks or cares about North Korea in our political discourse. But I really want, I, I want to, I want that to be part of our discourse because I think it's really important. So, and I, I do think that America has power in this arena. It might not seem like it to us, but powerful people have more power than we can imagine, more money than we can imagine, more influence than we can imagine, and I think we could influence North Korea for better. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about that. Um, I've been working some more on Heaven by Johnny X Rentata and just loving it. I'm meeting with a friend tomorrow to discuss it with her, and I cannot wait. And tonight, I'm meeting with a friend... Um, and I'm going to start my reread of 1Q84. So I think I'm just going to go through some of my notes for parts of it. 
Um, and then parts that don't have a lot of notes, I probably listen to on audiobook. So I'll read those parts. I don't know if I'll, I don't think I'll reread the whole thing because it's just kind of long. But yeah, if you guys are gonna read along with us, you can get started at any time and we will let you know when the live show is gonna come up probably sometime in January after my vacation. So, and I've been working on Eclipse and enjoying it so much. I'm like 20 something percent into it and I need to box Victoria because yeah, it's so fun. I'm really enjoying Eclipse more than I think. Actually, I really enjoyed the first 75 percent of Twilight. So it might be towards the back end of it where the plot is supposed to be coming together. That's where I tend to be like, <sighs> she's not the best plotter, but I really enjoy the emotional journeys of the characters and uh how they become creatures. So anyways, yeah, Heaven by Joni Extentata, by the way, as well. Uh, I'm loving, loving Heaven. It's so good. It's making me, it's very scriptural and it's really making me think about Heaven in ways that I haven't before. And I'm really excited to be thinking about Heaven because it's just making me happier in general to have something else to focus on than just me and my life now. So yeah. Um, yeah, she, she's so humble too. Like she, she's like, she talks about, for example, how she doesn't think that Christians are going to be punished for our misdeeds because there is no condemnation in Christ. That's how she used to imagine it as a kid. Yeah, everybody's going to know all the bad things that I did. It's going to be shouted from the rooftops and they're going to see a movie of all of my misdeeds and be like, oh, that's how the real Johnny is. She's like, I don't think that's how it's going to be. She said, I think we're going to get rewarded for the good things that we do that were unrelated to our pride or things that taint it. She's like, I don't know that there will be very much that I've done on earth that was untainted by my pride and sinful but even if I just make it through as through a fire, which is another scripture, um, hey, at least I'm in heaven. <laughs> like that can't be too bad, even if I don't really bring any of my works with me because they're tainted with pride and other things. At least I'm in heaven. Like that's a big victory. So she just made me feel a lot better about that because my perfectionist anxiety self is always like, yeah everything that I do is ruined <laughs> all the time and I suck. And she's like, I wouldn't worry about it too much. You know, we're all going to have a lot of that being burned away and that's fine. God can use that stuff here on earth. And, um, in the meantime, we can be having a great time in heaven. And she, she talks about making plans with friends to do things like horseback riding and climbing the mountains and things because she's in a wheelchair. She can't do that here. And she's like, I think since there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, I'm going to be able to climb these beautiful mountains. I'm going to be able to make a date with my friend to go horseback riding. I'm going to be able to do all these things. Like we can make exciting plans together with our friends here on earth for life after death. And it's going to be so much better. We won't have the bodily hangups that prevent us from doing stuff like that. And we'll have all the time in the world to hang out with friends. We don't have to mourn not being around them when we want to be or whatever. So she just really makes heaven... She, she's put a lot of thought into it from just mulling over scripture. So I'm really enjoying that. And today we had, we, we had like a revival today at church. We got to go to church today for the first time in like a month again. Uh, and it was so great. It was, it was so great. The theme was thankfulness because of Thanksgiving coming up. And it was so energetic and l full of life. And everybody was sharing thanks and things, things that they're thankful for, like the whole church was sharing things that they're thankful for. And um, it was really wonderful and energetic. So yeah, for both of us, Kevin and I both enjoyed it. So yeah, it's been a great weekend and a great week. And I think I'll wrap it up here. But um, yeah, let me know what you guys are looking forward to reading this next week and what you really enjoyed this week. And I will talk to you soon.